Okay, so welcome to our best of 2021 um, data visualization. So uh, two weeks ago, Kyla talked about data wrangling, our, our favorite data wrangling tips. And today I'm gonna talk about data visualization. Uh, so the link to the material should be in the chat. And the data that we're using today is going to be on chocolate. So great, great topic, I think. Um, if you want more information on it, the link is also in that document. So this is chocolate rating specifically. So this is um, chocolate tasters rating chocolate bars for flavors, which sounds like a bit of a dream job. So one of the variables you have here is rating between one and five. And then you also have where the chocolate comes from, when it was reviewed, uh, the cocoa percentage, um, a list of ingredients, and just some text that the raters could type in. So what does it taste of? Uh, so um, that was Julia, just, mm -hmm. are you sharing your our studio right now? Uh, I'm sharing it. I meant to share everything. Can you not see my R studio? Uh, no, we still see oh. the Julia Jenner. Oh, great. OK. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let me try again. I was, yeah, I meant to share everything, but that didn't work out. So let me just share our studio specifically. Okay, how about now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, good. Um, okay, is it big enough? Yeah, okay, good. So here's the link. I was trying to show you this. Um, I was, yeah, tr following that link and trying to show you that link. If you, can, if you want more information on the data, you can follow that. Um, and as always, we'll need the tidyverse to start with, and we're reading in the data. Uh, we can have a little look at it. So here are the variables that we have. Um, most of them we're going to ignore. Uh, interesting is going to be the country of bean origin, so the cocoa beans, which country did they come from, uh, cocoa percentage, uh, ingredients, which is a bit of a list. We'll, we'll do a little bit of wrangling to get that into a more usable format. And then the most memorable characteristics we won't work with that, but that will be an interesting kind of mini text analysis um, task if anyone wants, um, wants to do that at some point. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's again what it looks like. So you probably know this head command. And recently I've started not just using head, so not just seeing the first six rows, but use, using slice sample to get a random, in this case, 10 rows from the data. Because sometimes the first rows are not very representative of what the data looks like. So then slice samples of getting random rows can be more interesting to get a bit of a view. And then if you repeat that, you'll get different 10 rows and so on. So um, that kind of is a mini uh, data exploration tip, I guess, a little bonus. And then for wrangling, we're going to do a couple of things. So I'll just go back here so you can see what the data looks like. Mm, something that's a couple of things that are not ideal here. So the cocoa percentage, you can see that this is a character at the moment. Uh, the reason for that is because it has the percentage symbol sign um, included. So then R doesn't read it as a number because it it yeah coerces it to text. So it thinks this is text, so this that's why this is a character. But we will need this to be a number as it as it should be. Um, and then the ingredients. So the ingredients have a format of number of ingredients, and then a hyphen and a space, and then they have abbreviations. So a list of ingredients, and these are abbreviated. So S for sugar, um, C for cocoa, and so on. Um, so that's also not very usable. Um, this one we won't really work with. And then the rating double, that's fine. So that's a numeric uh, variable. So we'll start with uh, separating uh, this ingredients column. So this one. And we'll just um, separate it at this point. So where there's a hyphen and a space. Because three is the number or three and two and so on is the number of ingredients. We want that to be its own column and then we want the list of ingredients in an extra column. And that's what we're doing here. So separating the ingredients column into number ingredients and list ingredients. Um, and the separator is just um, a hyphen and a space. So we'll just do that first. Just run that so we can see what that looks like. Okay, and now if we go through, 
we can see that that worked. That was okay. Um, and then the number of ingredients that should be numeric, that's still a character here. So we're just using a mutate to change a couple of, of um, columns here. So number of ingredients should be numeric. Then I want to work with whether a chocolate bar has vanilla or not. So we can look at um, whether that makes it taste better or not. Uh, so here I'm using a case when, so this is kind of like an if else. So if um, something, then do something. And if that's not the case, then do something else, like an if else. Um, case when just kind of looks nicer. I think I could have done if else here, but it doesn't really matter. So if you detect a V in the list of ingredients, that means there's vanilla in it. So then the vanilla column that we're creating here should say it contains vanilla. And if that's not the case, say no vanilla. So that's what that's doing here, then converting this to a factor. Um, and then for the cocoa percentage, which is a number at the moment, because of that um, percentage uh, symbol, we're just removing that. So string remove, uh, just removing that. And then we can convert it into a numeric variable. Um, and then also one last thing. So sometimes we have missing values in the number of ingredients. So what I'm doing here is I know that when the cocoa percentage is 100, that means the chocolate bar is purely cocoa. So it only has one ingredient. So if the number of ingredients is missing, so is an A number of ingredients, and when the cocoa percentage is 100, then the number of ingredients is one. And if that's not both true, if that's not the case, then just keep the number of ingredients as it is. And then finally, we're just changing everything that is still a character to a factor, which isn't quite right for this most memorable characteristics because that is actually text, that is actually a character, but I'm not gonna use it, so it's not a big deal. So here's what it looks like now. All right, so the main thing is the cocoa percentage is numeric, number of ingredients is separated and numeric. Um, yeah, the rating still numeric and we have this new vanilla column that we're gonna work with. Okay, so some wrangling, I'm gonna pause in case there are questions on the wrangling before we move on to the graphs. Okay, all right, so then we're gonna make two plots. Um, so we can show, we can actually show these tricks on some plots. So the first one is going to be cocoa percentage and ratings, so just a scatter plot um, to see if the higher the cocoa percentage is the, does that improve the rating or do people prefer higher cocoa percentages? Um, and I'm also going to do that separately for if the chocolate bar has vanilla or if it doesn't have vanilla. So I'm just dropping any NAs. Um, so if the information is missing, if we don't know if it has vanilla or not, dropping that. And then I'm just making that um, plot with geom jitter for the dots. And then I will also want to add a trend line. That's going to be our first graph. And that's what it looks like. Okay. So you can see uh, blue means that the chocolate bar contains vanilla, red means it does not contain vanilla. And you can see on the x-axis, the cocoa percentage. Um, and these cocoa bars that are, or chocolate bars that are purely cocoa, um, people don't love them as much, or this, this is kind of divisive, right? So you can see the trend line is highest around maybe 70, 75, yeah, no, 65, 70 more like. So here in the middle, so kind of an average um, cocoa content seems to be preferred if it's too little or too much, the line trends down. Okay, so that's our first plot. Um, and then the second one, for the second one, we're just going to count um, how often each country appears in this data set. So the country of where the um, cocoa bean actually comes from. Uh, so the first thing we're doing here is counting country of bean origin. So I'm just going to run this part. Okay, so you can see now we have just how often does each country appear here. Um, there's also, don't know if you can see it 
here, but there is also a category that says blend. So this is blended together from different countries. I want to get rid of that. So I'm doing filter. Um, country of, of bean origin is not blend to remove that. And then to narrow it down because 62 um, categories would be a lot for a graph. I'm filtering to um, anything that appears more than 80 times. So let's have a quick look before we plot it. And then we just have these six countries left. Uh, and then one last thing. So I can maybe just comment that out to see, show you what it looks like if we don't do it. OK, so here I'm making a bar graph um, of the countries of origin. And you can see that the order is just um, pretty random, right? But I would like it to be sorted by frequency. So which country, um, the countries that appear more often should be um, higher up. So I can do that with this mutate command, which is just a factor reorder. So reorder the country of bean origin variable by n, so by how often it's found. And then if we do that, we get a nice kind of ordered graph from high to low. All right, so these are our basic graphs that we're going to work with. And the first trick that I'll show is just a really quick one. So um, yeah, go on, sorry. Sorry, we have we do have a question to the wrangling. Would mm -hmm. mind going back before you go on to your um, tricks? And it's why is there an asterisk in your separator? Yeah, so um, sometimes we have the three, so the number of ingredients and the actual list of ingredients separated by a hyphen. And sometimes we have it separated by a hyphen and a space. Um, so the reason why I have this asterisk is, asterisk is to say this space, so the preceding element, the preceding character is optional. So that's kind of a regex, regular expression thing. When you have an asterisk, it means um, this here is optional whatever precedes it is optional. So that means the separator can either be just a hyphen or a hyphen in a space. Does that make sense? Cool, thanks. I didn't know that actually. <laughs> cool. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so most people will know these um, labels or so labs, labels, um, arguments in ggplot and most people will know that you can change the x-axis and y-axis labels, also the title, and probably people also know the subtitle. So we're going to add all of these, uh, but we're also going to add um, a tag and a caption. And these are two things that people tend to not be as familiar with or not be aware that these are an option. So I'm just going to add that. It's just tag equals and then enter whatever text and caption. Caption, I like to put the data source in it. And I'm just going to run it so you can see what it looks like. So the caption is just at the bottom. And the tag is actually at the top left, so plot one. And this is often where you can number your plots. So you can say plot one, plot two, or whatever um, you want to call it. And then I'm doing the same for the second graph. OK, that's just a really quick one. So just tag and caption are labels that we also have and that people tend to forget about. Um, then last year, we talked about theme. And obviously, these next couple of tricks that I'll talk about, these are really big topics. Um, so for each of these, you have a link to our GitHub. And if we recorded it, a link to the YouTube um, video as well. Um, so if you want to kind of dive more deeply into that, you can look at the, the materials and or the video at some point, um, because we'll just do a really quick um, recap of it basically. So um, themes, that's everything that's um, uh, not data. So uh, design stuff like titles, um, legends, labels, lines, and so on. So just to give you a couple of examples for theme, we can either do it manually like we're doing here, or we can also work with these presets that are inbuilt. So if you start typing, so theme and then underscore, you'll get a bunch of suggestions. So these are kind of preset themes that change the look of your plot. So if I just run it, so plot one and just theme light, 
you can see that it changes um, the color of the background and makes everything just a bit whiter and a bit cleaner. So that's one that I use a lot because it's a, yeah, it's a pretty good preset, I think. But we can also do a lot of things manually. So here you can see that we, we can use an inbuilt uh, theme and then also add things on top. So here I'm, I want to change some of the text elements, the title, the subtitle and the tag. So for the title, I'm going to center it and I'm going to make it bold. Uh, the subtitle also center, uh, use italics and I'm going to change the color of it, make it gray instead of black. And then the, the tag is a bit big, I think. So I'm going to change the size to 10. And you can see, so title, subtitle, tag, and a couple of other things are text elements. So you can see that I'm saying, okay, title isn't a text element. And then in those brackets, I'm changing or I'm specifying what I want to change. So if I run that, it looks like this. Oh yeah, and then legend position. So the last thing here, I forgot to say that legend position equals top. That just moves this, this um, vanilla legend explaining what the colors mean, just moves it to the top of the plot. Well, that's one example. And then we can also work with um, the second plot. So here, if I just um, pull it up again, so without the changes, uh, what bothers me is that here next to the country names, we have these ticks and I want to get rid of those. And then also, I don't like this default light gray background that ggplot just um, gives us as a, as a default, not, not a big fan. So you can change that with panel background. Um, this is a rectangular element. So this is not a text element like title and so on, but it's a rectangular um, element. And I'm going to say fill is transparent. So here you can also set colors, but I'm going to say transparent so that it just takes on the color of the, the rest of the background. So it should just be white. And then access ticks, because I want to remove them, I can just say element blank. That'll just remove things. Okay. So you can see that removed um, the ticks and it also made the background, um, well, white in that case or transparent to be exact. Okay. So those are a couple of theme uh, options. If there's any questions, just interrupt. <laughs> And then the next uh, topic I want to have a quick look at um, are custom colors. Again, that was an entire workshop. <laughs> and here are the links if you want to have another look at that. Um, so there are inbuilt color options for R. So basically, this is about changing um, the color of these dots and lines and changing the color of the bars in the second plot. Um, and if we go back to when we made the graphs, we had to use uh, color equals vanilla and also fill equals, equals vanilla. So the difference between color and fill is that color is for smaller areas. So color is for things like dots um, and fill is for larger areas. And here we need fill um, for the confidence intervals around the lines. Um, and also for the bars. So here we have uh, fill is country of origin, right? So fill is for larger areas, color is for smaller areas. So when we change uh, colors, we need to know if we're talking or if we want to change the color of something that was called with color or something that was called with fill or both at the same time. So I'm actually going to just run the first part. So you can see what it looks like. So you can see it changed to yellow and green, kind of <laughs> neon yellow and green. And it changed the color of just the points and the lines, but it didn't change uh, the color of the confidence intervals here. Um, and we can change that with um, scale fill manual. So we need both because we have both color and fill um, in the data. So if we run that, you can see that now it works because we have both scale color manual and scale fill manual here. All right, so these are presets and R has actually hundreds of um, presets. Um, these are not very pretty though. <laughs> and um, what, what we often do is either use um, hex code so you can set manually any color that you want. So here's an example of that. The command is just the same, just in values, you just list two hex codes 
instead of two color names. And now we have this kind of orange, orange, red and blue, which I think is much nicer than this neon yellow and green. Um, and we can also use color palettes that come from some other package, so from some external package. Viridis is a really popular um, and really nice one. So here's our bar graph with um, a Viridis palette. That's what it looks like. Uh, it's also colorblind, friend, colorblind friendly, which maybe isn't for a, the colors here are just for, um, you know, visual appeal, just to make it look nicer. But if the colors are actually really important and kind of distinguish categories in your plot, it's good to check if this is um, color, colorblind friendly. Um, so this is from the Veritas package. If you're not familiar with this notation, this means from the Veritas package. So Veritas with these two colons means the next command is from the Veritas package and I don't have to load it in. If I'm just using this one um, command, I can just type it like that. And discrete equals true. Uh, we have to use that because these are categories. This is categorical data. Um, if we had numeric data, we could just leave that out and it would work. Uh, and then another option, so this is from the Palatia package. This is a package that um, collects a, really hundreds of different color palettes from other packages. Um, so the command is scale fill Palatia underscore D again, because it's discrete, so categories. And then here's just an example, um, just see what that looks like, it's quite nice. So this is from the future visions package and the palette is called earth, right? So these are a couple of options. You have inbuilt colors, you can use these hex codes and you can use someone else's color palette. We have a couple questions. Sure. So first of all, um, the first one is, is there a way to choose specific colors within the Viridis palette? So does that mean kind of getting the hex codes for the colors? The very, because Veritas has several um, palettes that you could pick, or does the question actually mean pick specific colors from it? Um, I'm not sure. I think, I guess with Veritas, you have to choose either, you have to take all the colors that it gives you, right? So like if you had discrete with six categories, you have to take the first six that it gives you. You can't like switch one of them out. Okay. Yeah, you can't do that. You can't, I don't think you can do that with um, any of the palettes, any of the pre-built palettes that you have. You can't just mm -hmm. pick some of the colors. Yeah. So the point about hex codes is also a good idea because mm -hmm. you can um, like if you screenshot it and then upload it to a hex code finder. You could find that color and, and take the hex codes. Yeah. Or you could use some program like um, GIMP can do it, I think. Oh yeah. Or Photoshop um, can also kind of, some kind of a color picker function. If you like um, a specific color, then you can get the hex codes and just put them in mm -hmm. as possible. There's also a comment in the chat that says you can maybe do it with the color space package. I have, I don't actually, oh. I'm not actually familiar with that, but um, that sounds like a yeah. useful tip. Is color space the one where you, you can give it a picture and then it gives you the most prominent colors as hex codes? I feel like I've tried that before or something similar mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. people sometimes get really good results with like um like movie promotional materials like um, pictures and and things like that and then they get mm -hmm. the most common colors from a specific picture or a painting or something um is that color space let us know in the chat yeah <laughs> yeah just picking that up okay in the chat there's also there's like an example code where you can pick four of the colors from a red palette for example mm-hmm and we nice. also have, we have a lot we have a lot of helpful stuff going on in the chat. Great. <laughs> There's a Stack Overflow in there as well. There's also a suggestion of a Pokemon themed palette. Nice. So there's some very yeah. cool stuff in the chat right now. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Chat. There is another question, which is uh, how you have set it up that you can see the figures right below the code. Yeah, I think um, this is just a. Oh, this is an option up here somewhere that. Um, I have just on by default and I've never had to do anything with that. I feel like it might be this option, expand all output. So I've clicked on this um, settings drop down menu. So if if you're running your code and it won't show up in, in your markdown, I think you might have to play around with these options. I've never had an issue with this, so I can't really, not really sure how to help, but I feel like it's probably this one. Mm -hmm. I would try, I would play around with this one, yeah. 
Yeah, and in general, it's also because it's an R Markdown file and it's not yes. um, in our script. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I was assuming people are running code alongside with me and uh, it doesn't <laughs> show up for them. But yes, this is an R Markdown. So everything we do also with the wrangling, you can see or with here, the structure command, everything shows up here in my document. Yeah, that's the beauty of R Markdown. <laughs> okay. Should we yeah, move there's on? one more question. Oh, yeah. that I think it's getting mostly answered in the chat, but the difference between the underscore D and the underscore C for <laughs> scale fill palette here. Yeah, so this is just underscore D is just saying that um, these are categories. So this is not, we're not showing um, numeric values, but we're showing how often a certain category is, is shown. Um, so this makes a difference for, for which color palettes are available some of them only work, some of them have um, just a certain number of colors defined, so say 10 colors defined. And if you try, that only works with discrete data then, so only categories. And if you try to show some kind of a range of data, so from low values get really um, light colored and high values get really dark colored colors. <laughs> um, so you need kind of a smooth color spectrum. That would be for continuous data so for numeric data and these are two different kinds of palettes in this package so we, you need to know is this discrete data different categories which we have here so then you need the underscore d or do you need um, a range of data numeric data i hope that makes sense there are also um if you google the palettea package there's an, an explanation there as well that i think is quite good okay so then let's move on to fonts. So uh, now we have custom colors and we also love to use custom fonts. So again, that was a whole workshop and here are the materials. And um, we talked about quite a lot. So as a quick example, I'm just going to show you how to use a Google font. So if you search for Google fonts, there's a whole list, there's a long list of, of Google fonts that you can really easily um, download and then use in your ggplots. So this is this um, needs another package, which is called show text. So I'm just going to load that here. And then the command is just font add Google. So what I've done is basically I've just scrolled through the list of Google fonts that I um, could find. I found one that I liked and I noted down the name. So indie flower is what I picked for today because I want it to be spring. So flower seemed nice, sounded nice. Um, and it's important here to uh, copy paste that exactly as it is on, on Google. So capital F and so on. And yeah, it needs to be exactly like that. So this is name equals and then the name exactly as it is listed. And then family. And here you can enter how you want to call it in your plots. So I've just picked Indie just because it's a bit shorter. So this is your choice. You can use what you like. So I'm going to run that. It's going to take a second. And this is essentially, um, yeah, letting us use any Google font. So you could run this command with different fonts several times, and then you'd have all of them available in your R session. And then we also need to run this show text auto, we just need to run that so the fonts can actually show up in our plots. So every time you add a new font, you need to also run this. And then in any of our plots in theme, so we need theme again for this, uh, you can say text, so all text elements um, should use this font. So here's how, where we're using family, this family argument where we're using the name that we gave the font. Okay, and this is what it looks like. So this is kind of like a handwritten looking uh, font. And you can see all the text elements have been changed to that font. So you could also, so here I'm just changing all text elements to this um, font, but you can also do, um, you, have, you could have the title and the subtitle in different fonts um, or the title and uh, the X and Y axis labels in different fonts and so on. Right, so this is just a quick example to show you, here's how you change everything to a specific font. Okay, and then talking about fonts. So, so far in our first plot, I'm just gonna show you that again. Okay, 
So in our first plot, um, we um, have a legend here that tells us, okay, the red points are vanilla, blue is, uh, sorry, red is no vanilla, blue is vanilla. Um, so we have a separate legend for that, but it's also really kind of elegant to explain uh, in your title or subtitle uh, what the colors mean. Um, and for that, we can use the GG text package. Um, and I'm going to switch to these hex codes. These are the same hex codes that I showed you earlier. So we already know the scale fill and scale um, manual, scale color manual to just switch to the nicer color. So I'm just going to run that to show you that again. Okay, so this orange is vanilla, blue is no vanilla. So now we want the subtitle to say, um, yeah, to contain that information so we can get rid of the legend. Um, and this is where the ggtext package helps us. So it lets us do that. It lets, it lets us color code only specific words in a text element. So here I'm doing it in the subtitle, uh, but you could also do it in other text elements. And it also lets us use uh, markdown formatting. So that means if you put something in two asterisks, it'll show up as bold. If you put it in one, it'll show up in italics. So what we're doing here is, again, this is just the labels um, command and the title should say, do chocolates with higher cocoa content taste better and higher cocoa content should be bold. So that's why I'm putting it in these asterisks. And then the subtitle should say, do these raters like vanilla in their chocolate or do they prefer it without? And vanilla in their chocolate uh, should be uh, this orange because that's um, what that color means in our plot. And do they prefer it without should be this darker blue. So basically explaining in the subtitle what the colors mean and then we, we can delete the legend. So um, we're doing this um, by wrapping this vanilla and the chocolate into um, this thing, which just specifies color and then it has the hex code, right? And then we're ending it here. It's like, you can think of that as kind of like closing a bracket. So this part of the text should have this specific color and then should stop here. The or should be just the color that the, the rest of the text is. And then we're doing the same thing for do they prefer it without with the different hex code for that blue color. And then almost done, but then we also need to go to theme and say that both the plot title and the plot subtitle are now element markdown, not element text. Element markdown is from ggtext and that just makes sure that this shows up. If we leave that out, it's just going to look like this. It's not actually going to change the color. It's just going to keep the asterisks. So that's why we need this, these two lines. And then we're just removing the legend because we don't need it anymore. And then here's what it looks like. Right, so this subtitle now is color coded. Right, and you have higher cocoa content as bold. Okay, so that's a really nice way of explaining what the colors mean without needing an extra legend, especially if you only have a few categories. If you have a ton of categories, maybe it's going to get a bit messy, but um, if you only have a few categories, this is really pretty um, to describe it like that. Okay. Mm, questions before I move on? Okay, so then we could also add annotations in the plot. So it's somewhere in the plot area to explain what's going on or to interpret um, the data in some way. So there are two things. And again, this was an <laughs> entire workshop. Um, the, there are two things that we can point out. One is that this high, or not chocolate content, cocoa content, um, people don't seem to love that. I imagine that's pretty bitter. Um, and we can point that out. So we can put text in the graph, maybe somewhere at the bottom right to say, this is not everyone's cup of tea. So in ggplot, we have um, the annotate uh, function. So this is in ggplot, no extra package for this one. Uh, so here I'm saying, okay, the ty type of annotation I want is a text. I wanna write a little text. Then the next uh, argument is where should that text be? So here 
we need to look at what the scale of the data is. So it goes on the x-axis, goes up to 100. We want it to be a little bit to the left of that. So we've, I've picked 95. You're going to have to um, play around with that a little bit. And yeah, it'll probably take you a couple of tries to find a good position. And then the y-axis or the position on the y-axis is going to be 1.6. So just roughly here where there's a little bit of space. OK, so that's going to be a text box. Um, and this kind of annotated plot, I for me, it's always um, better to run that in the console and have it show up here on the right in the plots um, window. It doesn't show up that well. Can you see it now that I've zoomed into, into the plot? Can you still see that? No. Nope. No. Okay. Uh, all right, so I'm going to stop sharing for a second just so I can share it properly. Okay. How about now? Yeah. Okay, okay. great. Uh, okay, so you can see at the bottom right, my text box got added that says reviews for chocolate bars with 100% cocoa are mixed at best. And it's at the position that we want it to be. So this kind of bottom right. And then we can, oh yeah, and these um, backslash n, that just means new line, kind of a line break in case that's not clear. So that's the first part, this first annotate. And then we can also add an arrow and that's how that works. So this is geom curve, so kind of a curved line that also needs position. So it needs a starting position, X and Y and an ending position. So where should the line start? Where should it end? Um, then here, this just adds a little arrow. Otherwise, this is just a line, but this just adds a little, this little arrow thingies at the um, top. Uh, and then we can also set the color and the curvature. So should it be straight or should it be curved in one way or the other? So if we run that, and again, I'm copy pasting to the console because it tends to show up better this way. And now we have an arrow here that doesn't quite manage to point at that little um, dot. So I need to make that maybe a bit lower. So this is a point where you probably have to play around with it a little bit to see where it shows up the best, or maybe you want it to point up to these dots. Maybe we can do, um, have it end at 1.4. See if that looks better. So this is, you can see this is really manual, right? You're really like, changing the position and just figuring out what looks best. Yeah, I kind of like that. So now it's pointing, the arrow just ends a little bit more yeah, higher up. So I'm pretty happy with that. So that's how we can annotate manually. So just using these inbuilt ggplot uh, functions with a text box and an arrow, if you like. Um, but there's also a package, ggforce, that lets us do it automatically. So here, what, what we could also point out, and I'm gonna just run, or just show you the plot again. Um, so the highest ratings here are given to chocolate bars that have kind of an average so 65 to 70 ish percent of cocoa, not too high, not too low. So we can also, or what I would like to do now is draw a circle around data that's kind of here in the middle and annotate that and write a little text explaining the best ratings are given to chocolates with an average cocoa content. Um, so ggforce adds a couple of new geomes. Um, here I'm using geomark circle. So I want to draw a circle. There's also, you can also draw an um, ellipse or a rectangular shape, I think. But here I want a circle. And this um, geom also needs aesthetics. So it needs to know where it, where it should go, right? Um, and here, so what we've done in this plot is use fill and color in the original plot, use fill and color to have a separate line for chocolates with and without vanilla. So if we don't do anything about this, we'll have two circles drawn, one for vanilla and one for no vanilla. But we don't want that. We just want one circle in the middle because the tendency is pretty similar that 
an average cocoa content is the most delicious apparently, no matter if there's vanilla in it or not. So that's why I have this part of the code. So in the aesthetics, oops, in the aesthetics uh, brackets here, I'm using fill equals NA and color equals NA. And this is basically saying for the purpose of this circle that's gonna be drawn, ignore the fill and color um, arguments that we have in the original plot. So instead of drawing one circle for vanilla, one circle for no vanilla, just draw one circle for the entire data. So basically ignore what we said earlier. And that's just for this one geome because the aesthetics is just in this one geome. Um, so then the next uh, line lets us just, this is also optional, this is just to specify where should we draw the circle? So what should the position be of that circle? This is very long, but it's just a couple of these kind of logical statements. So um, the cocoa percentage should be between uh, 65 and 75. So that's just on the X axis, it should be around here. So 65, 75, around here. Uh, and then rating should be between two and four. So on the Y axis, it should be between two and four. So this is just for the position of the circle. And this is going to be roughly accurate because it's a circle, right? So it's going to include some points that are strictly speaking outside of that, but that's just to give the circle kind of a position. And then finally, we can have a description. And this is our annotation text, right? This is what whatever we want to say about this. And once again, gonna run that in the console because that tends to look a bit better and I'm gonna zoom in so you can see it. Okay, so you can see that this has added a circle around the data the way we want it to be. And here's our comment interpreting what's going on in this plot. Okay. Okay, uh, questions on this before I move on? We have two more quick, quick ones. But any questions before that? No questions right now. Okay. In the chat. Okay. All right. So then, two quick ones. Uh, <laughs> one of them. So let me just call the second plot again, so I can explain it better. Okay. And now nothing is showing up in my markdown. No. Here we go. Okay. All right. So that was our second plot. Um, that was this bar graph. Um, and so it can be a nice kind of design choice to put the labels, so here the countries, inside of the bars. So have the bars be labeled from the inside instead of having it on the y-axis uh, in this case. Um, and we had, we don't, we didn't record that, but this is, this is from a guided Tidy Tuesday and there's code in there that shows you how to do it. So I basically want to move the label inside of the bar. Okay, so here I'm, I'm using, I'm adding geome text um, and the label is just going to be the country of bean origin. So exactly what we have here. And then the important thing here is to say age just. So this is a horizontal adjustment um, of one or 1.1. 1 .1, um, and that is going to move these labels inside of the bars. And then theme void is just going to get rid of them over here because we don't need them twice, right? So, and that's what that looks like. And now we have the labels inside the bars. All right, so that was a quick one. Um, the 1.1 actually can also do one, maybe that's better. Yeah, so then you can see they're aligned with the end of each of these bars. Okay, and that's how you can move them inside the bars. So that can look nice with these really simple um, bar charts. And then another quick one is using images instead of dots, so instead of points. Um, so for that, we need GG image, another package, and we need to have an image which is also in the um, repository on GitHub. So this is a little chocolate bar that I downloaded and saved as a, as a PNG. So GG image um, adds a you know, new geome, which is geome image. 
and basically instead of using geom scatter or geom um, jitter sorry um we're going to use geom image um and we're making a new plot just very quickly um and we're going to filter to just data points from Nicaragua, so cocoa from Nicaragua, uh, just because we'd have way too many um, dots for this to look nice. So this looks the nicest if you have kind of few data points. Um, so then we're making kind of the same plot as before. So just the a percentage of cocoa by rating, so kind of a scatter plot, but instead of dots, we're going to have this, this image. I'm going to just quickly show you what it looks like. And this is what it looks like, right? So instead of having dots, you now have these little chocolate bars. And this is just because of GG image. Um, so we have geom image and the aesthetics um, just have this image um, command and I've read it in here. So I've read it in before and then I'm going to call it in here. And this asp is the aspect ratio of the image. This is kind of, something else that you need to kind of play around with until it shows up um, nicely. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. We have some uh, challenge ideas. So if you want to uh, have some fun with this, a um, couple of ideas. Uh, so you could try to recreate that scatter plot, but instead of using vanilla, try using if the chocolate has salt or not, not, and then you can make it as pretty as you like with colors and fonts and annotations. Uh, you can also try to recreate this, pick some different image and then try to recreate that, maybe change the country that it's from. Um, and then when we talked about this labels inside the bars topic, there is also a way to make the position of the label dependent on the length of the bar. So for example, for these first four countries, we could maybe have it inside the bar. And then for the last two, we could have it next to the bar outside of it. So a challenge would be to go back to, to the materials that was on Star Trek data and figure out how to do that. Just a couple of ideas if you feel like playing around with that. And yeah, I'll be here for a couple more minutes for any questions. Great, 